Fellas. What it do? What it do? What's going on, Nasty? How's it going, Dirty? Joe, appreciate you coming I, on with us, brother. Anytime, anytime. How you guys doing? Good, good, man. Good. Well, this is our first video, YouTube. So welcome to our YouTube channel. Uh, today we have uh, the Ultimate Fighter season finalis, current double champ, Joe Gianetti in the house today. What's going uh, on? Nasty. This is a special episode for us, man. So uh, I appreciate you coming on, Joe. If you want to, just introduce yourself. Tell everybody kind of who you are. What's going on? I'm Joe Skeletor Giannetti. If you haven't seen me before, I was on season 27 of The Ultimate Fighter, Steve Bay versus Daniel Cormier. Um, I made it to the finale. I lost a split decision, and I've been fighting my way back to the UFC ever since. Now that we've got word that the UFC is coming to Boston in August, I'm hoping to get a quick dub in July and kind of, you know, send my name to the top of the list to get on that card next. Hell yeah, man. Well, me and Nick, we were actually talking about it right before you came on. We don't see a reason why you shouldn't be fighting on that Boston card, much less already have fought on a card. So we're, we're yeah, we're, we're a little confused on that, but we'll get your feedback on that a little bit. But uh, yeah, we want to kind of jump right in. So currently, you know, you you have a seven and zero amateur record, but you're fourteen and four professionally. Uh, one thing I want to highlight: you've never been finished, man. No, I mean, it's it's a stat that I never thought I'd really care about, but it is pretty cool to say that nobody could put me away. Nobody can put you away, but you have put a couple of people away. I mean, 13 <laughs> finishes, combined yeah. finishes, uh, you know, TKOs and submissions, but it seems like you're more of a jiu-jitsu guy based on some of your, your past fights. And, and uh, is that something that you kind of started in early? Yeah, so I wrestled in high school um, and I was atrocious at it. And then uh, I got into, I knew I wanted to fight by like my junior year in high school. And then after I graduated, I did a wrestling camp. And then after that wrestling camp, I got into jujitsu. And after like a month or so of that, I did like full MMA training. And uh, yeah, it's just been like the easiest path to victory for me. So I stick to it. Nice. Was that something that you kind of saw yourself when you first started? Did you ever see yourself getting to kind of the level you're at today? Or was it something like you wanted to do in your in your spare time just to get some training in and, and then it just be kind of came a career move after that? Uh, I didn't know if I would actually do it, but it was the plan all along. Like as soon as I said I was going to do it, I was like, like already told people like right to the top. And it was funny because, you know, um, me and some of the kids I went to school with, like, we were all UFC fans, so we would, like, watch The Ultimate Fighter on a Wednesday night, and then the next day at school talk about it. And then, like, one day I was like, yeah, I'm going to fight in the UFC. And they are like, oh, you're going to be in The Ultimate Fighter? Like, all right. We used to laugh about it. And then, you know, being on the finale and, like, them coming out to the fights in Vegas, like, dude, we used to laugh about this in high school. And I'm like, I know. It, 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 that's, that's fucking awesome. So how did that process kind of look? I know we were kind of curious. What did it kind of look like to get that? Did you get a call? Did you get like a, somebody reached out to you and said, hey, we want you to be a part of the Ultimate Fighter? What did that kind of what did that process kind of look like for you? Um, so they actually do just like any other movie or TV show. They kind of like do a casting call, but then, you know, the spin on it because it's reality show and it's fighting is there's mm -hmm. tryouts, you know. Um, so they invited anybody that fights at 145, 155 and 170 down to tryouts and i fight at 55 and 170 so i was like cool i got double the chance so i went down there i did the tryouts and then they're kind of like all right so what weight class do you want to do and i was like well i can do both and they were like well you have to pick one and i was like uh 155 i was like we'll stick with that one and then at the end of tryouts you know that every stage they were cutting more and more guys and we made it to the end but there were still three weight classes and every season there's only two so they got to the very end and they were like hey walter waits maybe next season. And I was like, Oh my God, thank God. I said 55. Oh wow. So they cut welterweight off the show completely. Yeah. Oh. So it was 45 oh, and 55 and you didn't know until the uh. very end of the tryout. So I was like, we're all sitting there like, all right, well we made it past everybody in our weight class, but which weight class are we keeping? And then they said, welterweight's got to go. And I was like, my heart sank. I was like, I almost wrote 170 on that damn paper. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> What was the feeling like knowing that not only you, but you were going into what was called the ultimate fighter undefeated. So everyone around you was also undefeated fighters as well. Did you kind of have like that, that little bit of motivation, like I'm undefeated and I'm going to be going against everyone else that's undefeated too. Or were you kind of like, Oh shit, everybody else here is, 
just as good, if not better than I am. What was the feeling behind that? Uh, I was kind of just curious, you know, because people say it all the time. Like there's, there's different types of undefeated fighters. There's guys that fight like the killer's row and they're undefeated. And then there's guys that fight nobodies and they're undefeated. But they're not the same fighter, exactly. They're, they're they're different, you know. And you know, you got a guy like Habib, who now he's fighting he, or was fighting like top of the guys in the UFC, twenty nine yeah. and zero. And then you have these random guys in the local scene. So to me, I was just curious, like, which guy am I? So my whole thing was like, all right, when we get there, I'm just gonna outwork everybody, and then we're all gonna find out which guy I am. Yeah. Well, clearly, that you know that worked out in your favor up until the finale because you you went in and you. You showed dominance quickly. I know one of the fights, I believe it was your second fight in, you had a very brutal choke submission finish, which was fucking awesome to watch. I mean, you it went unconscious and you just let go of it and you just laid there. And I was just like, that was badass. And then after that moment, that was what put you into the finale. Is, is that right? Uh, so actually, my first fight was the guillotine. Oh, that was 17 okay. seconds. And but it was kind of like uh, it was just the perfect way to start off the competition for me and my team. You know, everybody got so hyped because it was just like all we were all thinking about was like, who's going to be the first fight? Who's going to be the first fight? Then they picked me. And, you know, I already knew a bunch of people didn't think I was that good. And I knew like stylistically I was going to catch him in that choke. I didn't think he was going to tap. And when he did go out, I thought he was defending. I didn't think he was out. So, like, when it was over, like, I celebrated, but they're like, everybody else went crazy. And then there was like a moment where we all were kind of like, it's over. Like, we were all just so hyped up and it's already over. And then it was like, all right, on to the next fight. And I was like, damn. <laughs> and that, Nancy, I know you had a question about that fight. Dude, you caught him pretty good when it first started, too. You connected with a good punch and he came running in. I'm like, you're running against the wrong motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What? It was it was crazy, man. It was it was funny because that was one of the things about DC's team is he like he asked, he's like, What's your game plan? What do you want to do? And I was like, I want to crack him early and then grab him in a guillotine. And then it happened and we went in the awesome. locker room. He we went in the locker room and he was like, That's what you said you were gonna do. I was like, I know, and it actually happened. That's insane. That's crazy. <sighs> so what what was the experience like working with a guy like Daniel Cormier, you know? one of the best wrestlers to ever step foot in the octagon did did hit the training behind that did it kind of like help you in that where you're at now do you feel like you cherish those moments that you learned from him oh 100 percent uh it was like for my career the best things ever but as an average human being it was the most miserable times of my life because everybody's always like how cool was it to meet dc i was like it was great until he started practice and then practice was so hard you get over it so fast yeah. like the next day the next day the second day there was no like oh my god i'm training with dc it was already like sub coach because you're just dead tired and like and so and i think that's another reason our team was pretty successful like it was just work 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 and uh you know at some point in the competition um you know, Stipe decided to take out his team for dinner, like a nice steak dinner at a restaurant, like rented out a place. And we're all like, DC, when are we getting dinner? Like, I would, I could go for a steak <laughs> dinner. And he was like, you want a steak dinner or you want to be in the UFC? And we were like, all right, you got that. <laughs> Damn it, DC. I, I, I was like, you got a point there. That's yeah, funny. Yeah. I mean, he has that. He, I mean, he's an ex-wrestler. So, I mean, if anybody and everybody will tell you, if you wrestled at all in your life, you know the most brutal training of all time is stepping foot into a wrestling room i mean me and him know at first experience we did it for many years ourselves and there's there's nothing like a wrestling practice so i can 100 percent believe you when you say that it was brutal training under yeah. dc it was so tough i'm actually heading out to california in the next like week or so uh to get more work in with him and the wrestlers and it's just i'm looking forward to it because i know how great i'll perform in my fight but i'm not looking forward to it because i know how hard it's going to be yes no, that, that's funny so so now you're you know you get through the ultimate fighter you get to the the finale you lose by split decision uh and now you're back in cage titan where you've begun almost your second career and now you've you know earned two belts you know the welterweight and the lightweight belt um what do you which which weight class do you feel is your most comfortable currently um i feel great at 170 i just know that i'm not I'm not a I'm not top 10 in the world at 170 and I'm That's not in the in the physical place to be there yet. I think one day, but I do think I have a couple more years left at 155. Um so I do have a run in that weight class in me and then you know in a couple of years we'll take some time off, we'll bulk up the proper way and and then we'll make a run at 172.
So you feel like now, you know, I know in the past there's been some discussions about missing weights and things like that. Do you feel like 150, being that you're still comfortable at 155, do you feel like that weight loss is, you know, becoming strenuous or do you feel like it's been pretty easy here recently to stay and maintain at 155? It's been pretty easy. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just a matter of like getting it down to a science, which I have as of late, and then just making sure that I follow that to a T. You know, my last fight fell through because my body kind of didn't follow through with me. You know, I had a stomach ulcer, a staph infection, and uh, my body kind of shut down like right in front of the finish line of the weight cut. Um, but other than that, like the fight camp and the the weight cut like was perfect. It was flawless. You know, um, I missed some time training because I had a staph infection in the middle of camp, but I was like, I'm um, two pounds heavier is what it is. Like, I'll cut that too. And then the weight was falling off and then my body was just like, nope, we're done. So it's just one of those things of like, I know, you know, like I said, I was a couple pounds heavier than I wanted to be. It wasn't like I was super stressed about it, but I know if I'm at this number, the week of the fight, I'm making weight all day. So it's just about like aiming for that number and being fully hydrated, super healthy, not depleted. And then that week we can focus on cutting back the water and everything. And I know I'll make it every time. Gotcha. That's what's up, man. So um, currently you're on that five fight winning streak right now. Uh, coming up to this newly booked. Did this get recently booked like last week? Because I know I've seen an announcement. Sunday morning. <laughs> Sun Sunday oh, morning. So you got an upcoming July 22nd fight. Will this be for the, the lightweight belt? Yes, so this okay. will be a rematch for the lightweight belt. Um, the first time, if you guys haven't seen the post, the first time that me and Jacob Bone, my opponent, fought, I missed weight, um, and I offered him an immediate rematch if or if he even wanted to fight. Like, if you still want the fight, you get an immediate rematch, and here's my show money. Um, like, take the whole thing. You know, we get paid to show up and make weight, which yeah. I did not do. So I was like, take that, immediate rematch. It's all yours. It is what it is. Um, we fought. I TKO'd him in the third or fourth. I forget. Um, and he declined the immediate rematch and we've both fought a couple times since, and he just beat a teammate of mine on Saturday. So I'm like, Ooh. and if there was ever a time, it's time. That's what's up. So did he, his team kind of reach out to you and was like, Hey, we want to, we want to go at it. Or how did that kind of, how did that fight get set up? Uh, I asked for him as soon as his hand got raised, I texted the promoter and I was like him, I was like, that's who I want in July. I was like, I want that one back. Uh, yeah. you know, you know, my teammate, Zach, he's another top 10 lightweight in the area lost by a decision. Um, he did end up getting transported to the hospital, exhaustion, concussion. It's a fight, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like me and bone don't have anything super personal, but you know, at the same time, I can't watch my friend go to a hospital on a stretcher and then be cool with you. So it's like, after the fight, we'll shake hands again, but it's very much personal until that point. I love oh. that. Damn right. <laughs> you just, you'll get us hyped up real quick. You start talking about stuff like that. That's what's up. So it'll be for the, it'll be for the lightweight belt. Um, say you win that hypothetically, you win that. Obviously I think the Boston card will be before that. So uh, it'll be, it's a couple weeks after that. Oh, it is. That's in August. That's yes. right. That's right. Yeah. So hypothetically speaking, you win that fight. What do you feel like are the odds that you could potentially get that call to come in? If you win, do you think there's enough time or, or would you still see like, you know, a couple months out of that? If you, if you do get that big win to finally get that chance to go back in and, and make a name for yourself in the UFC. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. If I win that fight in the first round in impressive fashion, Dana White and the UFC are going to block me on every social media because I think everybody in New England and in there the world go. is going to be tagging them to put me on that damn card. Yeah. And, and I know plenty of my friends that are already planning on going. So if they're there and I'm not fighting, it's going to get real loud. So if Dana <laughs> wants to enjoy his night, you better watch Cage Titan 60 and sign me after I win. That's dude, that would be awesome. And I think we'll definitely be watching the fight ourselves. So, um, uh, Nasty, you got anything for him? Well, I, ho I hope we get that first round finish, man. I would love to see that happen. Yeah, that would be sick. Yeah, we were uh, we were talking earlier, man, and I just it doesn't make any sense to me how you're not currently fighting in the UFC. I've seen people that you beat on that show that have got the duty key team. Yeah, was on a fight night, and to me, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And I was wondering, what is your take on that? Like, why do you think this, this hasn't happened yet? Um, I think, you know, and, and not to say like the UFC plays favorites, but I, I think that when I got on tough, not like I was a, a feeder or like they signed me hoping someone else would beat me, but nobody like 
outside of New England knew who I was. Like, I was just some kid that the producers of the TV show liked. You know, they saw my fights, they liked my fights, and they put me on the show. But I don't think the UFC at that point in time was outwardly like, yo, we got to get this Joe Gennetti kid on a card. So then I kind of took him by storm. And then they were like, oh, wait, like, we missed somebody here. And then, you know, DC and Stipe fought the day after me. Um, it was on International Fight Week. One of the yeah. biggest international fight weeks of all time. The co-main event for Israel Adesanya before he really blew up. Yeah. And the fight kind of shit the bed. Um, you know, I, I'm a fan first, fighter second. As a fan, it was a boring-ass fight. As a fighter, I didn't perform nearly as well as I wanted to. Um, so I just think that I did myself a service on tough building so much hype. And it came to this point where it was just about to peak and then just plummeted short. Um, and, you know, Twitter was in flames. Like, you you would think I shot somebody's dog. Like, John Wick was coming for me. Like, <laughs> I, got, I got some nasty DMs. I was like, damn, bro, I lost my job. I feel you. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, I think it was just a really bad performance. And uh, they, you know, I think very much just wanted me to prove myself. And I think that everything's just kind of working the way it needs to work. And that's kind of the approach that I took after COVID. You know, during COVID, there was no fights in my area. So I went out to LFA. I lost two more decisions. And I kind of redid everything. I switched gyms at home. I started making sure all my fight camps are at AKA in California, um, which is much more expensive and makes things harder. But as you can see in my last five fights, my performances are much, much better, uh, more diverse. And I think that, you know, my mentality of just like, I'm just going to do what I got to do. And when it happens, it happens. I think right now it just seems like Boston is going to be when it happens. Do I know that for a fact? No, but it'd be a perfect fairy tale ending or beginning. Really I should say <laughs> it really would. And uh, I just, um, you know, Boston's not in a good mood right now in general after last No, time. no, <laughs> we are not. We need, we need a hero yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, that'd be great to watch, man. We were actually looking over like the current roster in the UFC. I'm like, well, this guy definitely needs a shot. And um, me and Joel were like, dude, what's the perfect fight that we could give him, man? If we could just pick one right now. Dirty Bird, you can tell him what's up. So I w I'm a big fan favorite of, of Jalen Turner. Okay. So I y'all's mad, like y'all stylistically, like y'all, the way y'all fight, oh, yeah, I would, that's a fight in the future that I would love to see. Cause... That fight will probably happen. I have offered to step in for him before when he's had opponents fall through. I love that. Um, yeah oh. yeah i he's good man he's good he's a huge lightweight i've watched him for years yeah. i am i am down for that fight so that that's one fight i would love to see but i also want to you know i want to talk about this and i know i've seen a couple of your interviews and a lot of people always bring it up fatty patty loves to talk his shit i'm not a big fan so i just kind of want to hear i know you guys were set up to fight a while back and then the weight miss the, the miss weight thing happened but he kept kind of running his mouth a little bit afterwards. I know you called him out. Is that something you would love to just get in and fucking get yeah. in there and eat? And it's becoming one of those things where, like, I see, I see, I think one thing, I think a lot of guys in the UFC underestimate his social media game. The guy keeps receipts. I'm also the same. I keep receipts. You know, you got guys like Matt Favola calling him out. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. and then Pat, Patty kind of roasted him by posting that video of Matt Favola, like, fangirling at the PI. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, damn, he, he kind of got you. Like, you really can't call him out again after that. So it's like a lot of these guys are calling him out because they know, like, he's, he's the payday. He's the big draw. He's yeah. the fight. Yeah, I'm going to get paid the same if I fight Patty or not. I just want to get my hands on him. Like, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not getting pay-per-view points if I fight Patty. My purse doesn't go up if I fight Patty. Will more people watch the fight? Sure, but that doesn't immediately put money in my pockets. I'm going to get paid the same. I just want to beat the dude's ass. It's simple as that. <laughs> like, I'm I getting paid. That. I'm getting paid either way, same amount. So it's like, it's not for clout. It's not for extra money. I just want to get my hands on him because, you know, we had our thing and... We said that we were going to be cool until the fight eventually happened in the UFC, and then he went back to Twitter fingers, and that's just not how it works in America. It's not the UK, so we gotta we gotta put that to rest. <laughs> Damn right. And if you if you did, I mean, if we all the whole world kind of saw his last fight, so we I think we're all under the same impression of. I think the world now sees what I saw years ago. That's why yes. I took that fight on such short notice. Yeah. Um, when I originally took that fight, it was very much a, like, he's a big name, he's a draw, he'll get me where I want to go, and he's not that good. Now I think people are starting to see that. I still think he's in that, I think he's like my, I think he's a little older than me, like 28. Like, he still has a bunch of potential, 
But unless he improves, he's going to fall hard. For sure. Big time, so man. You're still young. I mean, you, you have still, you know, a, a hell of a future left in you. Do you have anybody that you kind of want to credit your success to or, or anything, anything or, you know, anybody that kind of helped path your way, pave your way into fighting? Um, I mean, the biggest one is like my high school wrestling coach, Justin Burrell. He's been in my corner every single fight since I started fighting right after high school. Um, but yeah, everybody in the last few years has been helping me out. You know, I'm at BTT Taunton over here in Massachusetts. I go do my fight camps in California at American Kickboxing Academy. I'll stay at DC's Wrestling Academy. Um, and like, I'll tell you what, like those guys, like, like DC's a huge part. All the guys at AKA, Javier Mendez, uh, even like Habib, Cain Velasquez, everybody, like, yeah. I have, other than being a body in the room and, you know, being friends with the guys, I have nothing to offer any of them. I have no money. I have no clout. I've, I've got nothing. And they more than welcomed me to their gyms, you know, like that. D- DC, like I was a part of his team, but it's like, I lost the finale. I had, I have no clout to offer you as like a coach. If I, if I fight a couple times locally and win, but he's, always been in touch with me you know what do you need come out and train like you need to work on this you need to work on that he got me to aka same thing they're like you need this this and this skip this training session to go do that instead do this that like like i said nothing that's really going to benefit them in the immediate future and they consistently always have my back um even for like a year a year and a half before and during covid where i wasn't really going out there as much they were always checking in when's the next fight when are you coming back um, so all those guys, like, I really appreciate them. Like I said, just genuinely trying to help me out. That's amazing, man. And it is. It, it itself in a camp is just, dude, there's so much talent there. I bet you're soaking it in like fucking crazy, bro. A hundred percent. And it, and it's funny too, cause I say it all the time. Like, you know, there's a bunch of guys in that room that are like, dude, you're so good at this, this, and this. And then we go training and they whoop my ass. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm the worst one in the room every day which i'm cool with it gives me something to aim for but they're always like they're like no you're not the worst guy in the room and i was like i haven't won around in like six months what are you talking about (laughs) (laughs) i mean your fighting style is very i mean it's it's pretty unique to to a lot of people who fight right now like the big names that you watch you you fight so wide stance and and it's almost like you set that back leg kick up a lot um but yeah man we we've watched a few of your fights we we think you're more than deserved to to get in there and, and get into a fight. Dana White, if you ever so listen to this podcast, get this dude on Boston's card. Um, but yeah, man, any shout outs you want to give and any call outs you want to make, feel free to do it. Um, I know you play games, you stream, you do other things on the side, which we all enjoy watching. So please feel free. Let everybody know what you do outside of fighting. Yeah, you know, I got my opponent for July 22nd, so no more call-outs for now. That's that's a rule of mine. Once I have an opponent, Love unless that. you're coming at me, I'm not calling anybody else. There's already one guy I'm focused on. Um, but, you know, if you guys want to help support, I will have T-shirts on JanettiMMA.com in a couple weeks. Um, sponsor space is available on the back. I put sponsors on my website, my fight shorts, my banner. Everything basically just helps me with all my expenses of getting to California, staying out there for a couple weeks, and then traveling back for my fight week. Um, so if you or somebody you know has a small business that wants to sponsor me, I will do my best to help promote you and make it worth your while. Because it's definitely worth my while. I appreciate all the help, even just sharing posts, stuff like that. Like it's underestimated, not just me, but any fighter. If you want to support them, sharing their posts is so underestimated. It helps out a ton. Um, but yeah, you know, I do stream on Kick. I stream on Twitch TV uh, slash Genetti MMA. I've been slacking the last few weeks. So I've been working like crazy. But in the next coming weeks during fight camp, I'll be back on the weekends. But yeah, no, just you know, I always say it: help your local fighters. Because um, if you want to see them in the UFC, it's the only way they're gonna make it. Love that, man. Love that. Well, yeah, everybody, go support him. Nasty, you got anything before we wrap this up? I mean, California's an expensive-ass place, so please help my boy out, man. That shit. For sure. $28. No tip. It's, it's the only place that is more expensive than Massachusetts. So I go from the, the second most expensive state to train in the most expensive state, and I get out there every time, and I'm like, damn it. Yeah, well, we're down in Georgia, man, and I didn't want to bring it up because I'm a Falcons fan, so I'm sure you could, oh. you could rip my soul right out of me, but, you know, you we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave that in the past. Um, 
because you know my love for boston's probably not there but it is what it is you know it is what it is but hey joe man we really appreciate you coming on board with us and you know sharing your story and telling everybody else about us you know maybe later on in the year once you get a get a couple things wrapped up we can have you back on talk a little bit more but it was a pleasure man yeah, definitely. Anytime. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. Sorry, I was a couple minutes late. My dog was being good, so he had to go for a quick walk. <laughs> oh, dude, you're chilling, man. You're chilling. But uh, yeah, man, we're going to wrap this up. We'll see y'all next Tuesday. We got fight nights this coming weekend. Um, Kai France going to be ultimate fighter, ult- ultimate fighter tonight. So, you know, yes, sir. pretty cool. We got you on the same same day. We get to get uh, the return of McGregor. So. Let's see what it is. So we'll see y'all next week, man. Appreciate it.